Hello, this is Jeremy, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to use a second derivative to analyze functions and better understand what's happening with their graphs. What I'm going to use is the exact same functions that I used in the other 5.1 video, or in the section 5.1 video, where we talked about how to use the first derivative. So later on, we can combine all this information about these functions and try to sketch a graph without looking at any technology. All right, so before, when we take the first derivative, we find out information about where the function's increasing, where the function's decreasing, and any local extrema. When we take the second derivative, which all that means is take the derivative again, we can discover where the function's concave up or concave down, which there's a really good explanation for that idea in your textbook. This is a function we worked with last time, like I mentioned. And when we did that, I didn't go ahead and write it down ahead of time. When we did that, we got f prime of x equal to minus 4x cubed plus 100x. Okay, but in this example, I'm asking you to find the intervals over which the graph is concave up or concave down, and any inflection points. Inflection points are where we change from concave up to concave down or vice versa. So what I need to do is find the second derivative, which is f double prime, f prime prime. Nobody ever says f prime prime, by the way. They just say f double prime, which means take the derivative of the derivative. So I'm going to say, okay, f double prime would be minus 12x squared plus 100. Now, just as before with the first derivative, I want to know when the second derivative is undefined or when it equals zero, because that's where changes might happen. Well, this is a polynomial, so it's defined everywhere. So for this one, all I want to know is where is f double prime equal to zero? Well, f double prime is equal to zero when minus 12x squared plus 100 equals zero. Which seems like a really, really awful equation, but not really, because this is just minus 12x squared equals minus 100. And when you divide by minus 12, you get x squared equals minus 100 over minus 12, which simplified, I don't want decimals, I need exact numbers here. When simplified, this would be 25, because 25 times 4 is 100, right? over 3, because 3 times 4 is 12. All right, so finally, x is going to equal plus or minus the square root of this thing. In other words, plus or minus 5 over the square root of 3. So we get two points. And remember, f, we want to look, is f defined at these points? It is. Two points at which we would probably be switching from concave up to concave down depending on, we'll have to take a look at what's going on, right? So, okay, you can leave this like this, or you could uh, do the thing that you do in some classes where you rationalize the denominator. Either one is fine. Uh, both of these are equivalent. And, you know, I do need to know what these approximately are for when I pick my test number. So I'm going to check on the calculator what 5 divided by the square root of 3 is. It's 2.8. 8, 7. So I'm going to write that down. So this is approximately plus or minus 2.87. I'll need to think about that when I'm doing my partition. So in the same sense, these are numbers that we're going to break up a number line over. And we're going to use that to understand where the function is concave up, where it's concave down. Okay, so I go in and I say, well, negative is going to be smaller, so it'll be first. This is going to be the minus 5 over the square root of 3. And this is going to be the positive 5 over the square root of 3. And this time I want to know what's happening, happening for f double prime. So I'm going to plug everything in to f double prime, which is this function right here. Okay, so first thing I want to do is pick a number all over here, just like we did with the first derivatives. So remember, this is like a negative 2.8 something. So 2.89, 2.89, I'll write that a little bit better down here, 2.89. So a negative 3 would actually be okay. That would be in this interval. So I'm going to try to find f double prime when x equals negative 3. So f double prime of negative 3 would equal, well, it's going to be a minus 12 times negative 3 squared plus 100. I wanted to make sure to write this out so you saw what we're actually doing here. We're using f double prime. So when I calculate this, I get minus 12 times 9 and then plus 100, and that is negative. So I ended up with a negative 8. 
So in this part, this interval, f double prime is negative. Okay, now I need to pick something in between. Since we go from negative to positive, it's fair to pick zero, which I love being able to pick zero. So f double prime of zero, well, when I plug this in, I'm just going to get 100, which is clearly positive. Now, you won't always get alternating signs. Remember, we even saw an example where that was the case. So you still got to check over here. Remember, this is like a positive 289, so you can pick x equals positive 3. And f double prime of positive 3 will be minus 12 times positive 3 squared plus 100. And so now this is going to be the same thing, right? Because negative 3 squared, positive 3 squared, you get the same value, so we're going to get negative 8. So this is going to be a negative. Okay, so now I can actually answer this question, where is it concave up, where is it concave down? So f the original function, the graph, is concave up anywhere where we put a positive. So it's concave up on the interval minus 5 over the square root of 3 to positive 5 over the square root of 3. f is going to be concave down. In other words, the graph is going to be concave down from minus infinity up to minus 5 on the square root of 3. minus 5 over the square root of 3, and then union 5 over the square root of 3 to infinity. Minus 5 over square root of 3, oops, positive 5 over square root of 3 to infinity. All right, so these are our intervals where we know the function's behaving in that way, but what about the inflection points? So inflection points will be anywhere where you change signs and the point is in the domain. Now this is a polynomial, so all these points are in the domain. So it'll be anywhere where we change signs. So we have two inflection points. And the x values for those, so this would be at x equals plus and minus 5 over the square root of 3. So there's our other piece of information. Remember, we combine this with the first derivative, and we'll be able to draw amazing graphs of these functions. So let's look at a graph this time of this function with the inflection points marked out. As you can see, the red dots are the inflection points, and notice that uh, they're really close to x equals 3. So the first part of the graph, this piece right here, from here over. So notice, remember, it was minus infinity up to that five, negative 5 over the square root of 3. Notice how it's concave down, so it looks like a spoon with the, uh, with the curved part facing down. And then notice here, it's like the other way, a spoon with the curved part facing up. So this is where it was concave up. And then from here over, it was also concave down. The red dots are the inflection points. This function is also a function that we worked with before. And when we did that, we found the derivative that I wrote up there. So what we got to think about here is where do, or how do I figure out where this function has a concave up type of shape to its graph? Where does it have concave down? So I actually need the second derivative. Looking at f prime, because to find f double prime, I got to use f prime, I'm going to have to use the quotient rule. So I'm going to write out the product of the numerator and the denominator twice. Subtract them. First thing gets prime, second thing gets prime. And then I'm going to divide by the denominator squared. So this will actually be x plus 1 to the 4th power. Okay, so it looks like there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. So the first term I get 2x plus 2, and that's times x plus 1 squared, and minus, and I got my x squared plus 2x, and then times, now this one i got to use the chain rule, so I end up with 2 times x plus 1, and normally I got to multiply by x plus 1 prime, right? Well, I mean, always I got to multiply by x plus 1 prime. However, here I'm not even writing it out. Why? The derivative of x plus 1 is just 1. So it's really just multiplying by a 1. Oh, that's nice. So I don't need that there. So now I divide by x plus 1 to the 4th. Now, it seems like a lot of things will cancel here. And let's take a look at what could cancel. I don't know if you noticed here, but you can actually factor out a 2. This is 2 times x plus 1, and then we got our x plus 1 squared. And then I subtract, and look here, you can actually factor out an x. Now, is that useful, though? Probably not. If I was to go factoring out an x here, let's see, I'd be left with x plus 2. 
I don't know if that could really cancel with anything, so I'm going to leave it. Maybe I'll care later, maybe I won't. And now we're left with a 2 times x plus 1. Okay, so divide by x plus 1 to the 4th. Alright, so everything's got x plus 1 in it. So for once, I can actually cancel some stuff out. I can cancel this x plus 1, this x plus 1, and one of these. So I'm left with a 3 here. So what do I actually have? I have 2 times x plus 1 squared minus 2 times x squared plus 2x. And this is all divided by x plus 1 cubed. You may say, well, can't you cancel out these two here? No, you can't because it has to be just like here. It has to be a factor of everything for me to be able to cancel it out. All right, so I got to make a decision how much I'm going to simplify this. The more I simplify it, the easier it is on me later on when I'm plugging stuff in. Uh, but it's also a little bit of work now. But it seems like when I, let's see, when we multiply this, we'll get a 2x squared, or we'll get an x squared plus a 2x. You know, stuff's probably going to cancel out. So I'm going to go ahead and simplify this a little bit more. But I had to think about it a minute. So I get 2 times, I'm going to go ahead and FOIL that x squared plus 2x plus 1. And I'm going to distribute this minus 2. So I get minus 2x squared minus 4x. And then all divided by x plus 1 cubed. And then I'm going to bring this up here. Almost running out of space. I told you this would be a bit of work. I'm going to distribute this too. Let's see. What would I get? I'm going to do it down here and then simplify. So I, get, I would get a 2x squared plus a 4x plus a 2. So when I simplify this, let's see what will happen. I get 2x squared minus 2x squared, so those will be gone. I'll get a 4x minus 4x, so those will be gone. Oh my gosh, this was totally worth it because what am I left with? I'm left with just a 2 divided by x plus 1 cubed. Sure didn't look like that. I wasn't even sure if it was worth simplifying, but here's my f double prime. Okay, so remember what I got to do. I got to figure out where f double prime is undefined, and I got to figure out where it equals 0. Okay, so let's give ourselves a new screen to work with. And let's remember, let's put up here what our f double prime was. f double prime of x, remember, was equal to, from just a second ago, 2 over x plus 1 cubed. Okay, so now i got to figure out where is it undefined. This is a rational function, so we don't want to divide by 0. So f double prime is undefined when x plus 1 cubed equals 0. In other words, when x equals minus 1. Do you remember this function from 5, 1? When we look through it, if you look at the video for 5, 1, you'll see the same thing happen. Okay, now the question is, where is f double prime equal to 0? Well, that would be whenever the denominator, or excuse me, the numerator equals 0. So whenever 2 equals 0. Oh, well, that happens all the time, right? Except for it never happens. So this is not possible. So this is not possible. I don't know if I really have to write that down. I think you know that. But I wrote it down to make myself feel better, so there's no x values here. So no x values that would make f double prime equals 0 if you plugged them in, because there's no way. It'd have to be the numerator equals 0, and 2 never equals 0. So my only partition number that I have to use is the minus 1. So what I need to do now is figure out what's f double prime doing for things before minus 1 and things after minus 1. Well, before minus 1, probably the easiest thing to use would be an x equals minus 2. So f double prime of minus 2 would equal, well, that would be 2 divided by minus 2 plus 1 cubed. I'm not using the calculator for this one because it's such a quick calculation. 2 over minus 1 cubed. This is going to be negative. This is positive. We're going to end up with negative 2. So this is negative over here. Okay, where, what about after minus 1? Well, you know what's after minus 1 is 0. Love it, because now I can say f double prime is 0. Very easy to plug in. I get 2 over 1 cubed. This is simply positive 2, so it's positive over here. Oops, positive over here. All right, what does this tell me? Well, this tells me finally that f is concave down. The graph of f really is what we're talking about is concave down from minus infinity to minus 1. And the graph of f is concave up from minus 1 
to infinity because that's where I had a positive. What about our inflection points? You may say, well, minus one's an inflection point. You said whenever we change signs, you have an inflection point. But that isn't all I said. I said whenever you change signs and this point is in the domain of F. This is not in the domain of F. In other words, if you were to plug it in way over here, you would end up dividing by zero. So this is a problem. So there are no inflection points. So you may be saying to yourself, how can you change from concave down to concave up without an inflection point? Well, I think it's worth looking at the graph to see how that would happen. Okay, notice what's going on here. If I was to put in, here's that minus one. Well, let's see, how did they divide it? Minus one's about right here. So it'd be a line like right about there. It's not a very straight line, but imagine it is. So we were concave down over here to the left of that line and concave up to the right of that line. But that line does not represent an inflection point because an inflection point is on the graph. It's where we switch. This is actually an asymptote. So that's why the graph was able to totally change from one side of it to the other without there being an inflection point. 